Okay. Um, I'm not going to go over the test. If you want, if you have questions about it, please come and see me or go to the SI session and, and uh, talk with Josh. I'll go over with you. Um, I uh, I try and over the next couple of days get my grade book up to date so I can post grades, including all the homework that's been done at this point, as well as the exam. So you should be able to get some information about that on Friday. Um, I want to try and finish up chapter four today. We started talking about a particular timer last time. I want to finish discussion of that. There are other timers in this particular microcontroller, um, but we'll talk about how we can use the SysTick timer for more precise timing make than we can with just a pure software delay loop. This is still a software delay loop. Later on, we'll, we'll see how that we can use interrupts so that we can continue to do other things while our timer is, is still um, timing events. Um, no class on Wednesday because of the of the wellness of when, Wednesday. So I plan to be around, unfortunately, all three days. So uh, if you have questions, actually, I guess uh, okay, we don't have off Tuesday and Thursday. It's just I don't have classes, but I plan, I plan to be here um, on all three days. If you have questions, um, stop in and see me. Um, the SysTick timer. So uh, this timer capability is common on microcontrollers. This particular timer is a 24-bit counter. Um, and it, uh, it's a decrementing counter, so it gets loaded with an initial value. And then every clock cycle, it, it decrements. Um, so, and it decrements at the default clock rate. We saw last time how that we can change the clock, although I don't think there'll be any, any need for us to do so in this course. So just leave it at the three megahertz default clock rate. But again, there, there is a, High accuracy 48 megahertz clock available. So the, the minimum time that you can count with this counter would be one clock period or a third of a microsecond or 333 nanoseconds would be the, the minimum interval that you can count with this counter. Now these counters, the way they typically work again. Uh, you load it with some value. Then when it reaches zero, it sets a flag, or we'll see later on, we can, we can actually use it to uh, uh, generate an interrupt and run some interrupt code that we write. The, the maximum value, the maximum time that we can count with this particular timer uh, would be the, the, the 24 bits, so 0x, ff, 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 divided by the three megahertz. And that's 16,770,215 divided by three megahertz, um, which is 5.592 seconds. We'll see later on with most of these timers, you can use clock dividers. So you can actually clock it at a much slower rate to get a much longer time with, with less accuracy in that case. So you can time, any, uh, time events anywhere between uh, 333 nanoseconds or a third of a microsecond up to you know, a little over five and a half seconds with this particular um, timer. Um, like the IO subsystem, the SysTick timer 
relies on several registers. <laughs> um, probably the, the most important one is what's called the control register. And it's also known as the sys tick control and status register. I only mention that because you, you'll see in the code it's referred to using this pointer notation. Now here's the, the, the base pointer to a, a, a struct, and this is one element of that struct, but it's also referred to in the documentation as the SysTick Control and Status Register, or STCSR, and it's the same as the control register, the CTRL um, register. But the way that's laid out, it's a 32-bit it's a register, and so you, you'll see uh, diagrams like this in the documentation. Okay, so bit zero is the enable bit, so we can enable or, or disable the the timer. The next bit um, can cause it to generate an interrupt. The next bit is a clock enable bit. Um, and then bits 15 through three are all set to zero in this register and would never change. So sometimes you'll see a lot of uh, see documentation like this where, you know, maybe reserved for future use these bits, um, but, but you're not supposed to use them. Six, bit 16 is, is the count bit. Now it's not actually counting it will turn from zero to one when our counter reaches zero, our decrementing counter reaches zero. And so we, we'll check that bit to see when, when the time is up actually. And then bits 31 through 17 are also all zero. So this is the layout of the control register where these are the corresponding bits. And then this is the function. Corresponding function of the bit. And so you'll see that in the provided code, there are commands like set sysTick control equal to zero. That really is zeroing everything. It's you could just set the zero bit to zero. Okay, so that's that's disabling the counter. Um, and here we also see in the code it's set to five at one point. That's <laughs> that would put a one in bit two, which would be a four, and a one in bit zero, so that would be a five. So it's enabling the, the counter and then enabling the, the clock to the counter. Uh, the way this works, when it reaches zero, it will set the count bit in the control register and then automatically reload and start counting again from, from the load value. So there's two other registers, but uh, the count bit is set when the value in the val register. And you can read this val register at any time. So you can use it as an elapsed time counter. Goes from one to zero. So the other register we use is the desired is the load register and the desired count value is loaded into the load register. So here's, here's some example code. 
हम If we load it with thirty thousand and a thirty and the three megahertz clock, then the thirty thousand count divided by the three megahertz. Uh, that's ten milliseconds. Okay. So it would take ten milliseconds. If we load it with this particular thirty thousand value, it's going to take ten milliseconds for the count to reach zero. Um, or if you want to time out for a second, you need to load it with three million. It would be a one second value. So how do you, how do you use it? Or so here's some example code. So sys tick load equal 3 million. So we want to actually delay for a second. Okay, so we load it with 3 million. And then actually Writing anything to the to the val register clears the value val register and starts the count. Okay? So uh, when it's zero, then the on the next transition it will actually load the load value. Okay, so when it reaches reaches zero, it automatically starts the count over, initializing with the value in, that's in the load register. So writing anything there will, will clear the val register. So the next count. Val, the 3 million will be transferred into Val. The load register won't change. It'll still hold the 3 million. Then the next count, Val will go to 2,999,999. Then 2,999,998. Okay. Every clock period until it reaches zero. And then, so then we just have a busy loop waiting for. The count bit in the control register. So that is the 16th bit. Okay. So that would be uh, one zero 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 zero. Um, so while that's equal to zero, we're just going to loop. So it's an empty body for our while. Those are two curly braces. As soon as it gets to one, you know, we'll drop out of the while loop. So this is waiting for count to be set. So this is still a busy loop, but it's a hardware timed busy loop. So it's, it's very accurate, you know, within a, within a few clock cycles, within a few thirds of a microsecond, okay, is the, is the type of accuracy. Before we had, you know, we were using a busy loop, which was just, you know, counting up to a particular value with an integer, and then, you know, a certain number of clock cycles, and depending on the number of instructions that were in our C code. So this, this will give you much more accurate time delays than the, than the busy loops we looked at previously. So what I, what I gave you last time, and this is, this is from the textbook. Actually, this is code, you know, I think, uh, I, think I had you download the, uh, was it Valvano where is the code he provides on the text, on, on, um, on a textbook website. Um, and this is, this is code that's in that particular um, archive. So what I, what I sit, recommend, move this into your source directory. So that at any time you want to use these accurate timers, you just include this in your project. You have to call sysTick init, init. That, that should be before you go into your, into your infinite loop. 
And this initializes the counter. You could actually put anything in here for the for the load value, but this is in the final step is just enabling it. And then there's this cystic weight where you specify the number of the count, essentially the maximum count. That's get that gets loaded into the load variable. And then this is going to actually clear the value, which will then cause it in the next clock cycle to be loaded with the value from the load register. And then here's the busy loop. So if you call this cystic weight with a 30,000 value, it's going to wait for 10, 10 it'll uh, return after 10 milliseconds. Okay. So it will just wait here for 10 milliseconds and then return to wherever you call it from. If you call it with 3 million, it will uh, delay for a, it'll provide a one second delay. Is that clear questions about that? So this is this is a delay directly in terms of clock cycles. Okay. He also had provides another function down here, which calls this one, but it's a 10 millisecond delay. It just calls cystic weight with 30,000. So this, this would be a 10 millisecond delay. And then he calls it delay times. So if you call this with 20, it's going to call a 10 millisecond delay 20 times. So essentially giving you 200 millisecond delay or two tenths of a second is how that works fairly, fairly accurately. So any questions? So you can use this now to actually get a little more accurate delay. We'll see later on how we can use this again to, to set an interrupt, to call some uh, code automatically while we're doing something else. We don't actually have to wait here for this thing to count down. We can actually go on, go off and do other things while our, our counter is counting. Mark, you look like you're on the verge of asking a question. Yeah, this is, this is one of the questions on the homework. So how do we adjust, I guess, you, like, I know we can adjust the cystic weight 10 milliseconds, but I was just confused on how do you adjust the cystic weight? You don't adjust it. It's a number of clock cycles. So, so I think in the homework I said, assume the three milli, the three megahertz clock. That's the default. So, so, um, so this thing will return after delay divided by uh, three megahertz. So, if you call it with the thirty thousand. It'll be a, like this. This will give you a, a 10 millisecond delay from this routine. So you can only use this to get delays between 333 nanoseconds, which is one clock. And then if you call it the maximum value you can pass in, in 24 bits, it's the 16 million value. And that'll give you 5.6 second delay. So. Any other questions? So I, I said on the project, um, you know, that, um, let's do on Friday, I think. Um, you don't have to do this. You could just guess it using a busy loop with a count, with, with a uh, just a, an integer value that you're incrementing or decrementing and, and just a approximate one half second delay or something there. Okay. But if you want to use this for more accuracy, um, you can do so. Okay. So one of the things he does mention is that we can use this timer now to do switch debouncing, but he doesn't give you any code to do it. The um, And there are several different techniques for it's called debouncing switches. You can you can do it really easily in hardware with just an SR flip flop, but in most microcontroller projects now, uh, the switch debouncing is often done using some sort of delay. Okay, and there are a couple different algorithms. 
we're going to look at a, a really simple way to, to debounce a switch. It may not always work, but it, it, it works pretty well most of the time. So, so the basic issue is, you know, these are the these are the switches we have on our launch pad board. I think these are 10K resistors. I don't really remember. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Okay. So we've got those two user switches on our launch pad board that are connected to port pins. And so we can monitor those switches. And I'm showing this pull-up resistor here. That's not on the launch pad board. That's internal to the microcontroller. We have to actually set that resistor enable bit on that port to enable this, this pull-up resistor in order to use those switches. But this is how they're set up. And, and the basic problem is if you look at the, the signal on the input line, it's 3.3 it's volts with the switch released, not pressed. But when you press it, if, if you looked at it on a on, a oscillo, on an oscilloscope, it would there, there there tends to be bounce. You know, you press it, it actually pushes the contact away, and then so it'll look like again an open, and there may be you know a few bounces, often anywhere between one and ten bounces typically, of breaking of making and breaking that contact before it settles down into a fully closed uh, making contact with, uh, uh, with uh, both these connectors on the switch and the input going to zero. So this is the initial press. Okay. Again, this may not be an issue. You know, if, you, if you're just turning on an LED when the button is pressed and you can you could monitor that, you know, the LED may turn on and off here. You, you, you're not even going to notice that visually. Okay. But if you're using it to drive a counter, increment a register, um, again, this, this can be on the order of milliseconds, these switch bounces. So you can actually run several uh, instructions in your microcontroller you know, while this is going on. So if you're using this as an actual count, you can, you can actually see this and, and increment that value. It, it looks like it's opening and closing multiple times before it finally sets, settles down into this press state. And typically with, with push buttons, you're going to release it. The same thing happens on the, when you release the switch. And this may or may not be an issue, really depends on the application. But one of the things we can do is, is actually just use a delay after the first press or release, and then um, delay for a few milliseconds. He suggests in the book that we use a 10 millisecond delay to allow the switch to settle down. Okay, so we can get an accurate, so we can get an accurate reading. So some code to do this is we're going to have a, I called it press. It, it's, it's, it's what's known as a state variable to indicate the current condition of the switch. Of the switch. And I'm going to let zero be released and one be pressed. Because in C, zero corresponds to false, so not pressed. One would correspond to pressed. And then so with our launch pads, when you, when you bring them up, typically you know, you're not pressing the button then. So it would come up, it, um, we would initialize press to be zero. It's in the release state. Then what we can do is if it is currently not pressed, ampersand, ampersand here. And then that port pin, and that's pin, that's bit one, okay. 
Okay, so bit zero, bit one would be a two. If that's equal to zero, okay, so let me get that. And so this, this means I'm checking to see if, if it's if it's in the currently in the release state and then now is and now it's pressed okay for the first time i should be detecting that transition with this code what i'm then going to do is actually just wait ten milliseconds so that's that's using our ten millisecond routine with a count of one or you could use the weight with thirty thousand it doesn't matter either of those then I'm going to check again if P1 and ampersand is equal to zero. And if it's still pressed, you know, if it's gone, you know, here this is going to detect that first. Time we press the button after 10 milliseconds, I'm going to assume it's it's pressed again. Now this is also going to there can be noise here. So this is going to make sure that any sort of signal I pick up isn't due to noise. But after 10 milliseconds, if it's still zero, then I'm going to say the button's depressed. Set pressed equal to one. And in this particular example, I, I'm just toggling. Um, the green LED, toggle LED. And then close both these. And we have similar code actually for the release. There it would be if pressed and P1N and 0XO2, and then I'm checking to see if it's equal to 1. Now, why double ampersands here versus a single ampersand there? You remember the difference? What's comparing it? The other one is your end. They're both anding, but they're different kinds of and. Yeah, yeah you're right. Yes. This is a bit operation. So this is doing the bit anding. This is a logical anding. Okay. So in the logical case, uh, both of these have to be true. And that means any non-zero value. That's what, yeah. that, that's what you meant by comparison. Yeah, yeah so this is, so what the, the, they call this a logical and. So as long as this will be true, as long as both of these are true, which means both of them have to be non-zero. But now this AND is working at the bit level, right? It's actually doing a lot, it's actually doing a, a bit ANDing for each bit in the corresponding um, integer value here. This is an eight bit value, and then this would be ANDed with an eight bit value. So, but here, the logic condition is if this is if the button is currently not pressed and then that bit is equal to one and so that's a logical comparison that i'm using there so i'm going to use the double and if i use just a single and there it would be in, incorrect because this is going to well this will turn return one um this would be one actually it would probably work in that case but it's not the right thing to do so I, I put up example code. If we have time today, we'll, we'll run this. But here's the complete switch debounce code. I did some other things here, too. Um, so if you remember in the header file, uh, it had these defines for us. Bit 1 is 0x02. Zero zero bit 2 is defined to be 0x04. Zero zero so on and so forth. Bit 3 is 0x08. Zero zero so we have all of those available for 
words. So instead of actually typing in you know, zero x zero two everywhere I want to switch one, I actually just define switch one to be bit one. You could alternatively just use bit one here, or you could just use zero x zero zero two like we've done previously. Okay, so it's just convenient. And then I can refer to it everywhere in my code as switch one. Switch two was actually on pen four, right? That was, uh, which would be bit, no, it's zero x zero four. So it's bit, uh, I have to look it up. Switch two was connected to which port pen? Port one, um, I think it was pen four. Um, of the port, which is bit five. So that was uh, zero X one zero, I think, for switch two. But there you could just define switch two to be bit five. I always have to struggle with that. What, what he calls pen one on the port is actually bit zero in, in, the, in the byte. So this is actually, you know, configuring the, the switch, uh, setting up the selection <laughs> register, setting up the direction, um, um, enabling the pull-up resistor. And then this is doing the same now for the, the green LED, but using these keywords instead of the hard, instead of using the, the zero, the hexadecimal stuff. I, I find it just a little more convenient. The same down here when I want to toggle the green LED, it's just, Exclusive or with the with green. Okay. But this is just referring to a particular bit in that port. And it's bit one in that in that port. Um, so this is here instead of calling it press, I call it switch one. So if switch one state is zero, then it's currently not pressed. So see if it's pressed, wait 10 milliseconds, check to see if it's still pressed. Okay. If it is, switch the state. Now, what this is going to do in the release version, in the release code down here, don't do anything. So this is going to toggle every time you press the switch. So it'll go on and then off when you every time you press. It won't do anything on release. I think in um, alternatively, you know, you could have it turn on when it's pressed and turn off when, when it's released or something else, they turn on a different LED when it's released. But it debounces both the, the pressed and released. Um, here, I'm not really doing anything in the release. I could just actually leave all that code uh, out. But I put it in, no, you still have to change the state. Um, so you couldn't take that back. So any questions here about what's going on? And I, I don't think it really matters on this next project whether you do that because when you're using the switches, um, you press one switch, it counts in one direction or flashes LEDs in one sequence. When you press the other switch, it counts in the other sequence, right? So as soon as you press and you start going in one direction, it doesn't matter how many times it's pressed, it's still going to keep counting in that, keep cycling in that same direction. It won't change until you press the other switch. So it was purpose, purposely set up that like that, so you don't, don't really have to debounce the switches for that project. Sometimes this can lead to issues, especially if you're trying to count the number of times a, a button is a button is pressed. <clears throat> so um, a little bit about. It can be difficult you know, when you're coding at this level to find errors in your code. You know, you use a single ampersand instead of a double ampersand, okay? or you don't have enough, or you don't have the right number of parentheses to override some sort of precedence. So, how to how to debug? What what I'm recommending right now is actually that. You just use printf statements. And so put printf statements in your code. You can delete them later to indicate what's going on in your code. Okay. Um, you can put printf statements in every one of those branches, you know, where uh, we've got 
you know, I, I, you know, I might put a printout statement here that says, you know, uh, switch one debounce or something like that, and have that go out to the serial terminal. And then if I'm pressing the switch and I and I never see that statement, I know something's wrong, right? So um, that, that's that's a debugging technique called instrumentation. You know, it, it's it's modifying your code explicitly to, to help you figure out what's going on inside your code. Um, so he talks a little bit about printf. I know those of you who took CS210, certainly are familiar with all of this, but took engineering one, two, three. I'm not sure that uh, anyone talks about using printf there in, in C sharp um, uh, to, to display output. Well, to use printf, again, you can just start using it, but then you'll only see output when you're, when you're running in debug mode. If you run in release mode, um, you'll have to print to the serial terminal. In debug mode, the default printf will display to the debug console, but you can't see that in release mode. So we have to do uart.h. That's why this thing exists. It allows us to redirect printf output from the debug console to the serial terminal. Later on, we can redirect it actually to a little LCD display. So same printf, we don't have to modify our code. We just redirect where the printf output goes. So we have to include this header. And then the printf is actually, that prototype is in the, Standard io.h file. That's where scanf and put char and everything else is defined. Now, the other thing that you have to do, <clears throat> you have to make sure that you include uart.h and uart.c in your project. But this is the routine that actually causes the redirection. Redirect printf to the serial terminal. Again, you, you've got that built-in serial terminal in Code Composer, or you can use PuTTY. So, but if you don't do this, you're not going to see any printf output on your terminal when you run in release mode. If you run in debug mode, you'll, you'll see it, and, and that, that's fine. But, but then here's some example, example code. And he talks a lot more about this in the text than, than I'm going to. Um, just a brief description. So the first argument to printf has to be a string called the format specifier, okay. or the format specification string. Any ASCII that's part of that will be sent to the display. In that string, you can also have special what are called format specifiers that start with the percent sign. Okay, so percent C, percent D, percent octafort, hashtag, um, pound sign, whatever you want to call it, x. And then here I'm going to print the same value out three different ways. So the number of arguments after the format specification string has to match the number of percent signs you have here. There has to be a variable for every format specifier you have in the format specification string. So what you would see, and we can run this, 
on the display, on the display, you'll see hello world and then CC equal, and that's this part, okay? That's encoded directly in the string, we'll see CC equal. And then we'll see this 86 value printed as a character. It's the same exact value. It's 86 decimal. It's stored internally in this, you know, in this 32-bit integer in binary. This says, take that value, convert it to ASCII and send that ASCII code to the terminal. In this case, 86 in the ASCII table is at capital V. This says, display it as a decimal. So you'd see 86. This format specifier with the X, which is handy when you're debugging, says show it in hexadecimal. And in hexadecimal, that's a, that's a 56. So <laughs> the backslash N there is called a escape character. Backslash N rep, rep means new line. If I don't have that there, then the CC would, would be right after the hello world. Okay. The backslash N means give me a new line on the, go to a new line on the terminal. Okay. There are other escape characters, look them up. Got them in the section of the book. There's carriage return. Um, <clears throat> in C, the, the new line is actually supposed to step you down a line and then actually do a carriage return. Um, um, so it's rare that you use the, the carriage return by itself. Um, there's a tab character. There's actually a, a slash T. There's a backslash zero, which, which means the null byte. Uh, for some reason, if you want to put a, a null byte in a C string, then that indicates that that's the end of the string. Uh, the format specifier actually has, looks like this, various flags that are optional. You can specify a width, like you want it to uh, take up 10 spaces and then a precision, which it would be the number of decimal points in a floating point number, and then the specifier. But the, the common specifiers are C for a character, D for I for an in signed integer, signed. Int U for unsigned int. Um, X for hex using lowercase a through f for 10 through 15, or capital X if you prefer to see 10 through 15 displayed in capital A through f. And then S for a string. Here, the, the pound sign means give me an alternate form. Here for the hexadecimal, it says, it means show a zero X before the number. Without that, it would just show it as 56 and look kind of like a decimal number. So we, we can actually think, uh, create a new, project here to, to see this to see this working. So um, so go through all the steps here. So a new code composer studio project. Make sure I get the right compiler. I have an empty I have an empty project with name here call this lecture 18 example of uh, printf.
And uh, I, I recommend that you actually give your, if you haven't used the template main and don't write everything from scratch, you know, copy another one, you know, rename this to something that's a little more meaningful. It doesn't have to be called main.c. Okay. So, you know, just right click on it. Um, this thing's so incredibly slow. Uh, rename L18 example. Uh, I usually I usually have the, the source file that contains the main program be the same as the project name. Okay. Um, we need to actually add the files here from our source directory. So we're only going to use the uart.c and the uart.h. And then again, link to them instead of copying them over. So now what do we need to do? Okay, in our in our main code, we need to actually include the uart.h and uh, I need to include standard i standard io.h. If you don't include the standard io.h, I think you'll get a warning message, something about you know the type of printf is implied to be integer. Um, so we need to actually initialize the UART, that's the output init. And this routine is actually at UART.c, okay, this output init routine. It, it initializes that, that serial port to, to talk to our virtual terminal. Okay. And then I'll have int cc equals 86 and then just in a while loop um, print f hello world slash n and then print f cc equals uh, display it as a character display it as a decimal and this I'll, I'll display it with the lowercase x without the uh, pound symbol and then with the pound symbol and the uppercase x and then slash n okay so and then this is inside the while loop so it's going to print over and over um I'm going to switch it over to release. This should compile here on the, on the board. There's playing around with this. I mean, you, you could actually just do this using the, you know, the, the compiler we had for the PC that we downloaded earlier in the semester. So let me bring up Putty. And I already had his configuration set up for the launch pad. Then now download this to the board. Oh, I got I got an error, right? I didn't include, um, and it says this here. Um, and I forgot to include all the. Unfortunately, I already had uh, download. Um, I forgot to include the, the variables. So I have to actually put in here uh, CC. Now I've got four format specifiers there, right? <clears throat> Is this still in debug mode for me? I would have noticed that if I'd actually checked for errors. Okay, what, what am 
compiler errors. I think they're out there in there. You can spell it. Oh, you spell it. Oh, I'm missing a T. That's what you said, wasn't it? Looks like it works. So now if we download it to the board and put it up here. As soon as it downloads, it should should display, you know, hello world over and over again, followed by um, you know, printed out the value of CC four different ways. Um, as an ASCII character. So you kind of see it there. Can I stop this thing? I can, I can disconnect my board. Uh, let kill the terminal. Um, okay, so there you can see it. 86, 56, and then 56 hex, hexadecimal. Okay, that's it for today. See you at least in this class on Fridays.